trading is about knowing the field. Foreseeing the opportunity. Executing at the right moment. Timing is everything. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Rugby in partnership with City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. It's good to be back with you once again. We've had a mega weekend. We absolutely How have. How are you feeling? I'm very good, thank you. Are you? Um, great to You've go got back. Good bounce back ability for a man of nearly 40. Yeah, that, pardon? I'm <laughs> to 36, so right. just relax. I mean, nearer 40 now than I was, but I'm okay. Yeah. Um, great to go to your old club, by the way. Friday night, yeah. Edinburgh, hearing about what a legend you were. We looked everywhere for you on the wall. Wasn't one sign you Not ever were ever there. Not a photo. But you're wearing I'm the wearing machine. my gilet. I got given, we all got given gilets. You've, yeah. you've handed yours back, but I yeah, can't mind. Yeah, I just think geography teachers and certain <laughs> other kind of characters wear gilets. Well, you know, yeah. And, and you, 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 you either do work in the city or you are a geography teacher if you wear that. Well, we both, did a, both ambitions yet to fulfil. We did a live show at Aki's and the crowd was brilliant. Now, yeah. I could, I'm could i pretty certain within... Th- 30 seconds of the first story that we told, <laughs> half of them didn't know that's where the way the show was going. No. <laughs> there was one dude that I think may have died standing up just out of sheer shock. You know, this old gentleman, he was like this. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone was looking at him going, so, so are you okay? I mean, someone might have swore. Are you going to be right? <laughs> yeah. They had no idea what to expect. Yeah. And I we- think they were expecting a sort of nuanced intellectual discussion about the history of the Calcutta Cup and, you know, years gone by. And you both walked in and sort of <laughs> sawn off shotguns, yeah. shot out the lights. <laughs> in all fairness, we started quite strong. strong. We started yeah. really strong. And, 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 then and it got stronger. It was a good night though, wasn't it? At Amazing. a proper club with a real heartbeat. And, yeah. you know, in these times, we talk a lot about, you know, grassroots and, and some of the struggles. Edinburgh Rackies is not grassroots, but it's very good to see a club that has got a real heart. What, what a clubhouse, by the way. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I was a little bit... I was a little bit upset. I was slightly jaded from the two days before that I'd had because I th- well Cause actually no probably, brightly, but probably we not because it could have gone really pear shaped <laughs> if I'd have ended up staying with Hass for any longer. But yeah. uh, I think it, that saved me. Saturday and Bannockburn. Oh, uh, again a great day, a long day, but a very, 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 very good day. Made better by the sunshine. Uh, I was. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Snow capped mountains in the background. Uh, beautiful blue skies. Uh, we had, obviously, we did some stuff with the minis that was uh, fantastic. James didn't make anyone cry or send any eight-year-olds I off this time. I cry. did tell a few of them had they thought about trying something else other than rugby, which the parents <laughs> didn't find amusing. <laughs> um, we did a live show in the evening. Yeah, Tommy Seymour turned up, was, yeah. was brilliant. Lisa Martin. Lisa yeah. Martin, fantastic. Jimmy, the whole organiser. I mean, you dressed me up in a kilt. Yeah. Um, I thought you looked quite good as no, John McCaskill. No, you did. Actually. Everybody wrote to me going, "You look like fat bastard from um, <laughs> <laughs> fat bastard from uh, Gold, um, Go, uh, Austin Powers." Yeah. yeah, but then they showed pictures of it, and I was like, "Wow, I, I actually do look like I look like when fat bastards lost weight." Yeah. You know, he comes up the end. Don't He's like, hey, Paul, how are you? You don't quite have it. the subway diet. <laughs> the subway <laughs> diet. Yeah, Dana. Um, uh, sensational player sensational of the day. and yeah. um, Monica Monica yeah. the tackling machine both of them were utterly brilliant so it yeah. was it was a fantastic day all round thank you Bernsey and Polaris for having us to Edinburgh Ackies on Friday thank you to Vodafone for taking us to Bannockburn on Saturday our Bannockburn pod actually is going to be out uh, next Monday the third in our four stops for the Vodafone Lions Legacy Series it is really good fun to get out and about meet great people and see the heart and soul of the game in full working order so tune into that next week if you will before then a small matter of round four in the 2022 Guinness Six Nations. And we'll talk a little bit about England in a moment or two. But and you, amazingly, have been granted exclusive access yeah, to the England camp. Incredibly, they let me talk to Max Malins, who was on fantastic form. Very interesting, saw behind the curtain into what's been happening the last few weeks. Let's have a little listen. This took place earlier today. Um, mate, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah, real good. Uh, enjoying it. Enjoying it. How's the, uh, how's the fallow week? What have you been up to? Uh, so we actually had our thingy in Bristol um, last week. It was actually a short and sharp, just from Wednesday to Friday. Um, I only had training on Wednesday and a Friday. Had Thursday was just gym. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's based around just building connections and stuff. Um, so yeah, did a few activities away from the pitch, which was which was good fun. But building connections sounds like very media handbook. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, like, you know, yeah, go, yeah. going for coffees with the lads or? 
Yeah, going for coffees. Uh, we also went to a thing, All Star Lanes, um, like a big thing, where there's darts, there's pool, snooker. Um, so yeah, just getting together and, and having a good time. Who was the hustler on the on the? Was anyone hustling on the darts? Any money exchange hands? Uh, no, I think Johnny Hill and uh, Freddie were having a, a good darts competition. Freddie actually brought his own his own darts, so he was giving it big time. But uh, Johnny and Johnny Hill ended up schooling him, so uh, I think those darts got quickly put away. <laughs> so he was, so, so wait a minute, he turned up with all the gear and was toilet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he's had them in his in his bag since the start of camp and was been waiting to use them, and then yeah, unfortunately, uh, he came up came off against a better man. Was Ellis um, tour manager in Bristol? Did he take you to any places that were off the books or was it all okay? <laughs> he didn't know. It was all on the books, yeah. No, he didn't He didn't go too rogue. I'm sure he, he knows a few a few places down there. Did None of his mates turned up asking for him or asking for money or, or nothing no, like no, that? No, thankfully then? not. Thankfully not. We're hidden away in our hotel the rest of the time, so. How is he? We've Because obviously he's a big um, part of the Good Bad Rugby family. Um, when we talked to Freddie Stewart when he came on the podcast, he talked about how uh, brilliant he was in camp and what he's like at Leicester. How have you found him? I found him brilliant. Um, I think on and off the pitch, he's, he's becoming a real leader. Um, off the pitch, he's, he's one of those guys who will jolly around with anyone, uh, anyone and everyone. Um, so he's really, he's a great, a great team guy. Um, whether you're young, old, whatever, like Genji will always look after you. Um, so that's a big thing to, thing to have, I think. And then he's certainly growing his leadership on the field as well. Um, you obviously see it through his actions, how physical he is and stuff, but also he's, he's becoming a bigger voice um, and a voice of reason within the squad. So, uh, yeah, he's invaluable. I mean, Freddie actually said a bit about um, what he really appreciated about Ellis was how inclusive he was and how he wanted to get people to get their personalities. You're saying something quite similar to that in terms of, you know, making everybody kind of equal. What has he seen in kind of an actual terms you've seen him do or what does he do that really kind of um, sets him apart as a leader? Uh, it's tough to put a, put one thing on it, but I think with any sort of new member of the squad, you'll probably see Genji with his arm around him first, like he's straight there trying to make him feel welcome. Um, so I think that that that's probably a big thing for me. Like I remember I came in, and, um, it was actually Randall, so it was Randall's first time, and obviously Genji's good friends with some Bristolians and stuff, so given some secrets on on Randall and stuff. Randall comes in like quite coy and shy and, and sort of Genji's the first one to sort of rip into him and take the piss and just kind of like make you feel a bit a bit easier uh, and more at home and sort of take that tension away from it. Um, so that that's probably a prime example from what I remember. Um, yeah. So, so you've been obviously around this England squad for, for quite a while now. I'm right until you've got 13 caps, yeah? Correct, yes. 13 caps. I mean, how, how are you finding uh, making that adjustment to say, for example, playing at a full stadium you know, against Wales at Twickenham, you know, can you put into words kind of what that was like? Uh, it, was, it was pretty surreal because obviously you didn't experience it and, f and for my first, what, 10 caps. Um, and then the first proper one, I obviously got a taste of it in the autumn, which is brilliant, especially at Twickenham, unreal crowd. It, it's, it's all rather surreal, I think. It only really hits home when you're, when you're singing the national anthem, for me anyway, um, when you realise where you are singing the national anthem in front in front of your parents that are, are watching you right there and then it's that's when it really really kicks in but um i think yeah i've taken it to it quite well it's probably it's been, probably been quite nice and eased me into it that i got into some england games didn't have any crowds so it's obviously quite boring and that time not boring but you're right and, 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 i'll put and, words and, into your mouth yeah, well, it's awful well, no without a crowd no external noise or anything yeah. uh, nothing external to sort of get you up for it um and then I got to what two thousand for France, ten thousand in the summer. So it's kind of been like a steady build up, which I think has has done me good getting used to it. Now, obviously, you, you know, when you came into the squad, you've now got the likes of Marcus Smith and Freddie Stewart. All of these guys are kind of, um, you know, having big headlines. You've also been killing it yourself. But I mean, you know, do you do you feel there's a bit of pressure on you to 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 get everyone talking about you like these guys? Is that something you want to embrace, or are you just quite happy with where you are? I quite happily go under the radar, mate. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, rightly so. You, with Marcus and Freddie, great players, unbelievable players. Um, and when you get young people coming through like that, making such an impact, it's, it's always, always going to be the case. You're going to get headlines about you. Um, but I like to think that I'm going, going about my job, uh, going about my job well. And um, yeah, if I slip under the radar, that, that's absolutely fine by me. I don't need any headlines. <laughs> but I mean, how how far do you want to push this with this? With this England side, you know, what is it you'd like to to, to achieve? You know, 
Well, I think the beauty of it is we don't know where we can go yet. I think, as you already alluded to, the players coming through, the group that we're building, there is so much potential. Um, and obviously, we're at the minute, we're trying to marry this this old England with this new England, which is exciting. This new England, play to space, take the opportunities, uh, which has obviously fitted Marcus really well. Um, so I think it's really exciting. Obviously, there's you don't want to look too far ahead, but World Cup next year. So we need to get our stuff uh, going in the right direction for that. Um, but I mean, looking not too far ahead, this tournament, uh, we're still in it and, and we want to win it. So... Um, our next next sort of process is Ireland the weekend. For a personal point of view, you've obviously played brilliantly for England. What? How far off do you think you're from a from a, a mega performance where you're still in the limelight, or do you think there's things you need to change, or are you quite comfortable with the way you're going? Um, obviously, I'd always want sort of more involvements. I think there's kind of obviously playing at fullback and then coming here playing on the wing. Um, there's times where I, I've kind of felt like I'm having to kind of wait for the ball to get to me, uh, which I'm not kind of used to, but that just makes me want to sort of get off my wing more and then go find go find some um, some action. Um, so, yeah, I've, you've certainly not seen the best of me in an England shirt. Um, and I hope that, yeah, I can really put some good performances out there. But um, we, we go a lot, on a lot about our trademark Um in these camps um so we have these three things that if you stick to your trademark then that's it that's a good game and that they're all sort of effort based um so i think a lot lot of work that you don't see or don't or fans don't see or fans don't recognize that are actual crucial things um there's a lot of that going behind going unseen i think with with the trademarks, is that something Eddie's given you? Is that something you come up with together as the coaches? How, how would you work that out? Because I, when we used to play, it talks about your point of difference. You know, Billy Van Apole, his point of difference is Carrick. Yeah. You know, you don't want Billy, um, you know, doing a million tackles or clearing a million rucks. You want yeah, him yeah. carrying the ball. Is that the kind of thing? Yeah. So it's um, you come up with the, the three things yourself, and then you take them to the, we took them to the coaches, and they'd um, either agree or or give you pointers or what about this. Um, but the main thing is that they're all effort based, so um, you can't. It's not judged on necessarily consequence, um, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, it, it all came from from the players, um, and then coaches sort of tweaked here and there what they thought. And is that backed up kind of with your GPS? So, for example, you, you know, obviously we see how brilliantly you chase kicks. Um, and what you're like under obviously the high ball as, as a full back, but obviously running backwards and forwards in defence. Would you then go to the coach at the end of the game and, and they would say, listen, your GPS is a bit down. You've only done, I mean, how many K would you run in a game normally? Uh, it'd be eight, nine K maybe. Fine, okay. And and, then, and if it was under okay. that, they would compare it and say, listen, you're not working as hard and those kind of things. Yeah, well, the, the, the tough thing was that if you go straight on stats, it is very much based on how a game goes because you know you can get scrappy games, rain, so many scrums, line outs, that's really slow. So it's all all within context, really. Um but I mean, you, you very rarely see people that aren't working hard these days. I mean, <laughs> you know, you've got a GPS on your back you're gonna, and you, you're playing for, for England. So um, everyone's working hard. Now, you talked about a little bit, obviously, the, the frustration of, of, of being from 15 and going on to, to the wing. Obviously, you know, you've had some very good games there. How much is your relationship with Marcus Smith important? Like, you know, how have you found working with him? Are you saying to him, listen, mate, I'm on, get the ball out? I mean, how, how is that synergy going? I think it's going well. I think we, we, we've got a good connection. Um, we got a good, I think we got a similar feel for the game. I realise what he's what he wants to do and when um, and can kind of read read that off him. Um, as, as as you saw in the Italy game, there's been a few instances where we've connected quite nicely uh, and known each, what each other want to do. Um, and yeah, the more I can sort of develop that partnership, the better. Just just one last question. Obviously, you're playing, um, you know, versus Ireland this week at Twickenham. You had a taste last week. Just how excited are you um, to get back out there and, and how good has the training been going so far? Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a huge game. Obviously, we've talked about sort of Wales being our quarterfinal. Now, this is our semi semi-final uh, if we want to win this tournament. So there's a lot on it. Um, and obviously, being at home, that gives you even a, a bigger buzz. Um and yeah, training training has gone well so far. We had a good good week in in Bristol. Um, got some good work done, and then we got some good clarity done today. Uh, and then ready for for our big session tomorrow. So uh, we're looking. Just how much do you notice when? So when Eddie says it's like a semi final week, do you notice those guys around you lifting their standards? I know at England everybody's 
eating right, they're doing the recovery, they're doing their analysis, but do you feel a little bit more of a different buzz with a little bit more attention to detail this week? Yeah, I think so. I think um, even today you, you, you could see that a lot of our, our session was based around getting our knowledge right. Um, and we know how important that's going to be for the weekend. But um, I think everyone knows the importance of this game. And as you said, everyone is making sure that they're getting their stuff right first. Uh, and then that would then translate to the team stuff. Um, I mean, obviously, when you're looking ahead to play against a sort of team like France and they're, and they're so in form, you know, what kind of thing do you, do you do to have to adjust to that mentality when you know how good they're going to be? I think we're, we're forever trying to improve our performance. Um, I think la last week, a hell of a first half, we just couldn't really convert it into necessarily well, tries. We got points, but not tries. Uh, so we couldn't really take the game away from them. Um, but also, we don't want to look too far ahead. But if we can put a solid performance, the best thing for us is put a solid performance in against Ireland. And then, and then everything will come down to that last game. So, um, yeah, we've got an exciting squad. Uh, People can't wait for it, so let's let's get the job done this week, and then we we can look forward. Max, thank you so much. We're big fans of you at Good Bad Rugby. We love what you're doing. Good luck for this game. I hope you absolutely uh, you smash it, and I'm sure you're not far off absolutely killing it. <laughs> Cheers, Haskell. Appreciate Cheers, it. Mate. Well, a man in a hurry with the world at his feet, Max Malins. Before we digest and debrief and speculate on England, a quick word, a little postcard once again this week from Honda, the official performance partner of England Rugby. They'll certainly be hoping for a big old performance this weekend. And Honda are bringing the power of dreams to the game that we all love. They are playing a big role with the volunteers in the English game as well, which I think we've mentioned a couple of times. Developing a real understanding of how English fans feel about their sport as well, the supporters' relationship with the team, their achievements, the hopes, and of course those who dream the impossible dream. Dreams. Honda believes in a challenging spirit, embracing failure and the joy of trying things. And just like England Rugby and their supporters, as we said, Honda believes in the power of dreams. And you can find out more at www.honda.co.uk forward slash engine room forward slash England Rugby. Max Malins. Can Honda dream for me to... I've got this picture of being on a motorbike, going very fast around the corner and have my knee on fully on the floor. Can they make that dream come true for me, please, we Honda? We can certainly ask for you. Where would you like to do that? Anywhere. Okay. I, I dream of a dream of a Honda car. <laughs> Civic that's, Type R or something like that. Or, sat in my driveway. Yeah, or yeah, just that's what I dream of. With no monthly right. payments. I don't, I don't want to embrace failure. <laughs> I don't want to embrace that. I want to embrace nice cars with apps. Yeah, that I, I would like to not embrace failing to pay for it. So <laughs> if you do that would be great. Let's see what we can dream and what dreaming, dreaming, may your dreams come true. Manifesting it. Right. Max Malins. Brilliant. Beginning to really bed in. I think he is. It was interesting that he said he didn't want to um take the limelight, was quite happy to sit down, obviously, letting Marcus and, and Freddie Stewart take the, the the kind of the heat. He did say that he feels like he's got more to give, yep. but, uh, you know, to play 10 caps out of his 13 and have none of them in front of a proper crowd was pretty, was you know, it was pretty frustrating, but I think he's just getting a real taste for it now. Do you know what I feel he, uh, and hopefully I'm proved massively wrong with this because obviously he's a huge talent, is he sometimes, I think he's going to, he's almost falling into a little bit like the Goody um, Alex, Good. Alex Good sort of mould where people don't really give him the credit of the stuff that he does but you know you remember last year what he did for Bristol and now now that he's gone and a couple of other boys have gone back to Saris and how the difference in Bristol's performances so you know he's got a lot to offer and and but he just perhaps doesn't look like the stereotypical back three player does he in terms of quick movements and yeah my favourite part of that story was um, a friend of the friend of the show, Freddie Stewart, who we've had on brought his own darts. But how, there's no comeback from that. Like, don't bring your own gear and be toilet. So, I mean, I don't know how you live that down, but I reckon they've got gone straight in the bin because you can never pull them back out again. No, yeah. I used to take my own darts out you, you, in Wakefield. Did, did you really? Yeah. Proper arrows. Yeah. Did you ever play at Lakeside? Did yeah. you ever do that like celebrity stuff? Yeah, I played at Lakeside. I played. Uh, I played in a. Uh, exhibition stuff with the PDC in Wolverhampton in front of 3,000 people and I played at a uh, Premier League uh, is it the Premier League? Yeah, Premier League event in London in front wow. of a lot of people as well. We once went to a team social to the Ali Pali uh, with England and Phil the Power I don't really care about darts because I know who Phil the Power Taylor was he was there and I got introduced to him and Phil took a bit of a shine to me and Mark Coeto who is darts mad kept he, trying to he? talk to him just ignore him. I remember Quetz going, meh, 
I just go, fuck myself, you're not going to talk to me. <laughs> he got so upset. He goes, he doesn't even fucking like darts, like talking to me. And Phil was like nestling in, having a little bit of a hug, you know, asking me all this stuff. Quates never <laughs> never got over it. I was like, Man, I'm sorry. I, I was like, Phil, please talk to my friend. Just wouldn't have any of it. I once, oh. I once played against, uh, I was what, we were playing a warm-up with uh, Wayne Mardle. Oh, yeah. And Hawaii uh, 501. Hawaii 501. And that was quite good. And then he showed me a trick where he could spit the darts and he got a 120 by spitting them out of his mouth at the dartboard. I was like, that's just a joke. You normally see that in Thailand. So you go like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's pink balls. balls yeah. It? yeah. yeah. And it's all out of a different kind of mouth. Wow. <laughs> I've, never, I, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. I have. Pat Pong. Yeah. Pat, Pat Pong. Is it? Yeah. Apparently um, someone saw it, they're just so traumatised, like it was like early in the night. You know, like you go in there early in the night, yeah, you, you don't drink. Go, you don't like, do pat wow. early in the night. That's not yeah. a, No, but they, apparently they were like, you know, early sundowners just popped in for you. Oh my uh, God. Uh, Chloe won't let me go to it either. No, wisely so. Wisely so. Should we get back to English rugby or should we carry on on no, the I, dark I, I think, we, I think Maybe a GB and our tour to Thailand would go Thailand. down really well. Wow, <laughs> imagine <laughs> that. Kosan Road. Um, we're in a very good position. Eddie Jones has said, a little over 12 months before we get together for the final part of this project, three months before the World Cup is when all teams become equal. We all have the same amount of time to practice up to now teams of their players for different times. Let me get back to that. We're in a very good position. Agree um, or disagree? I would be interested if you took previous uh, interviews before the last World Cup and whether he said that a year out. Pretty sure he probably didn't. Um, I think I like the team. So I I like the players in it. I think the play. I don't think there's much argument around who replacing people out. There's, you know, I think we're starting to see him trust Marcus Smith, um, which I think everyone will agree is the future. So I think there is improvement still to be made in this England team. I hope it happens on Saturday against Ireland. I think it's uh, it's going to be a very tough game. Ireland will go in favourites, uh, and if but if England can find that sort of clinical edge um, in the la- in the in the final 40 then they can beat that island team it's a big but but Harry Randall said they are so close to getting that attack to click agree the, I, I think I think they are I think with him and that new momentum and actually the way Ben Young's played when he came on they're obviously showing the speed and maybe you know Ben Young's might now be the impact man or the finisher to, with that, old, that older head that more experience to see it off and Randall starts I, I think there's interesting juxtaposition as well between us and the other teams where we talk about Wales, for example. Uh, they lost, you know, I think it's 700 caps. Mm. It's not going to be there, right? I think one of the things when we, you know, talk to our next guest, we're going to talk about Johnny Sexton and his position in the team. You know, that's an old head with a lot of experience, but who's the next in line? At least with this England team, you've got people across the whole board that are being upskilled. And actually, we're not going to suddenly have a cap black hole because they all are getting experience. They're relatively new. And so while we miss out on the experience and probably the game management at times um, and that ruthless edge, we're actually getting people up to speed so there isn't going to be a vacuum. And I think that could work in our, in our favour because you look at some of the other teams, except potentially France, you know, who've got all new players. I think the other nations... A lot of these guys are getting on slightly and who who's next in line. I think we can pretty could, clearly see that. You could almost say that we are France a year ago. Yeah. Maybe 18 months ago. But not quite as sexy. No, we need to improve the haircuts yeah. in the England squad. Although I've noticed Slady's got rid of the bounce at the back. Yeah. I mean, we are we have got, I mean, I, I don't, can't really talk about hair because I'm clinging on, but there are some awful haircuts. I just don't think the, you know, the French are just, everything they do has just got a little bit of je ne sais quoi, you know. Muff. 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 <laughs> That's what they get because they look so good. <laughs> right, it's that time of the week. Just tell each other a good joke. Um, um, Alex Boxing Arch Curzon. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a very warm welcome. This is I have to read while you two scoff. It's a very warm welcome. It's that time again to our official pizza partner for the Six Nations. It is... Are you calling? Domino. Oh, oh, Domino. This is our dough baller of the week section. Domino's have pulled out all the stops and made special dough balls for the good, the bad and the rugby. Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid, disclaimer, they're not widely available. Uh, We are going to select a dough baller of the week. Obviously, no Six Nations action to throw it out, uh, throw the bouquet at. So I'm going to nominate Jimmy Samuel from Bannockburn RFC, who treated us to a belting day on Saturday. We are normally giving the bouquets out to the big boys playing in the Six Nations, but sometimes you've got to give to the real heart and soulers of the club game. And Jimmy has done a fantastic job at uh, Bannockburn. We had a great day, and I think he deserves a pizza or three. I agree. Who are you going to nominate? Okay, well, my dough ball of the week is actually the Wasps women's team 
who beat uh, Harlequins for the first time ever. And I want to give the voucher to the entire team for the ladies to go and enjoy themselves as they see fit. That would be a good post-match yeah. after the next one. Um, I'm going to do it for a sob story, actually. I am going to throw out there, just for the heartache for Luke Cowan Dickey, who was playing exceptionally well and obviously has got quite a serious knee injury and might not even play, might not be able to get back this season. So I think just to send Luke, you know, just to say we're thinking of him and here's a pizza. Because nothing cheers you up and the doorbell goes and the Domino's is there. Oh, you are a marketing man. I bloody well am. And do you know what? He'll be video game with a headset on arguing yeah. with tiny American kids <laughs> so he can just trough into that well, while he's working. Do you, th- do you right. think in this period he's going to get back to number one in the world? I'm then? pretty certain he will. Because, you know, he became number one in Search and Destroy on Call of Duty in the world. Yeah. And he's probably part, part of a gaming syndicate. Now, he has a few cu- couple of kids. I'm not sure his missus is going to let him get away with it. But with a buyer off with half a Domino's, can I play a bit more games? Tell you what, your England match fee pales into insignificance if you start winning those big tournaments, isn't it? Oh my God, yeah. I'm amazed you've never taken up gaming just for the cash available. You haven't got the concentration. Oh yeah, I suppose, yes, your, your mangled f- fingers. They're not even fingers, they're fangers. No, I liked, I, I, I was a bit of a gamer, to be honest with you, at times, but my dad, well, two incidents happened. My mum, when I was younger, hadn't done something, so she stormed in, pulled my PlayStation out the wall and threw it over the road into a field. <laughs> That's where the anger issues come from. Yeah, she pulled it out the wall and threw it. And then my dad came in once and went, I'm, you know, goes, you can waste your life sitting on these games. I don't want to have this get off your ass." And I just stopped gaming. Right. Two for two, elevated music. And while you do that, just a reminder that Domino's are offering 50% off pizza when you spend £30 or more online. A big thank you to the team at Domino's. We are having a lot of fun with this collaboration. I think I've almost gone through the entire menu. Time to start going around the roundabout again. What I did... <laughs> What I did. What I did quickly want to just touch on, given we are talking about pizza, um, uh, not not the most obvious of segues, but there was a lot of talk about Shane Warne and his margarita pizzas. And it's not often that we sort of cross over into other sports, but it does feel with something like that that you want to. It's just just the most shocking news in every sense of the word, isn't it? Yeah, it's awful. 52, obviously family, just a complete legend of the game. Again, we... We talked about it actually um, in, in Bannetburn about people kind of using the word legend for different things when actually it's overused and people are put on pedestals for, for no reason. But someone that eclipsed and epitomised everything that was good about his sport was Shane Warne. You know, a man that w- was the GOAT mm. of what he did and a character as well, loved to, loved to tear up, loved to perform on the field, had character, had chat, had a persona, um, and I just think it's awful <coughs> at 52, you know, to be taken now. Like, we've lost so many people in the last few years, and, and the, even in our world, in different sporting worlds. And it's just an utter tragedy, really. And again, it just reminds you not to take anything for granted because you never know when it's going to end. Yeah, desperately sad. You knew him, didn't you? Yeah, Where, yeah, where I, did you know him from? Well, I've played golf with him a few times. Um, and obviously, James Erskine was his agent, who was uh, Zara, who is a family friend of Zara who we stay with when we go in Sydney. So we've had numerous dinners with Shane and, uh, yeah, I say I played golf with him a few times and did come out with the best lies. He goes, you de- he goes, life's not about regrets, it's about living it. And he definitely did do that. Yeah. Um, and he, he was just a, a constant smile, constant banter, loved, just loved chatting with everyone. Um, and he will be, he'll be sorely missed. You know, he, he, you know, you know, you're a legend when you get in a, I think he's getting a state funeral, funeral yeah. isn't he? Okay. Um, Shane Warm, as we said last week with Inga the Winger, uh, gone and certainly never, ever forgotten. Let's move on. So as we put our pizzas away, we'll yeah, come back to these a little bit later on. We will celebrate Shane with a margarita pizza. And um, I hope wherever he is, he's got a couple of those to enjoy. Let's move on. As we mentioned, England, Ireland this weekend. Um, we spoke to Max Malins. Thank you for joining us. Let's bring in another legend of the sport. He's an Irish centurion with three Grand Slams to his name, 218 caps for Ulster, a couple of Lions tours in there as well. And to top it off, he's the only Irish captain to have beaten Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. It is only Sir Best. So, Rory Bass, come on in. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks, guys. Good. Oh, it was great to be on. You're very, very welcome, as always. Um, so many things to talk to you about. We're obviously going to get into the game itself, but how are you, first of all? What's happening on Planet Best at the moment? Uh, I'm good. We are busy, very busy, um, doing a little bit of coaching in the local primary school. My wife, has got she teaches her, and she's got me roped into taking the 
the 10 and 11 year olds um doing a bit of farming we're just starting to have the cows the Aberdeen Angus cows and uh, doing a little bit of work with an insurance company as well so I'm in and out of London bits and pieces so very busy that is a diverse portfolio which of the farming the insurance and the coaching the under 10s is the most challenging uh oh the coaching is under 10 so oh my <laughs> goodness I mean like it is the first question is are we doing contact today and I am always really interested as to what what point in time you change from wanting to do contact every time you take the field to never wanting to do any contact, even at the weekend. It springs up my my next point is it's a great CV, obviously, that he's holding there. But one thing that is missing is his appearances for the Irish legends versus the English legends, which obviously is happening this Friday. And you uh, are playing. And I'm playing, yeah, yeah, um, at the Stoop. I'm sure tickets are available if you go through the Quinn's website. Um but I know that Munch, uh, Shane Byrne, doesn't often relinquish the two jersey, but I think he would definitely allow you for a little trot out. So when can we expect you to see you at these magnificent events of watching really guys who are really well past it play rugby? I'm not 100% sure Munch will relinquish the number two jersey. <laughs> um, I never get an invite, and um, I'm actually reasonably happy about that. <laughs> I don't really like to say no, but... Munch is a man there. I'm I'm very happy to keep an eye to see how the score goes. Make so, sure everyone comes through it in one piece. If they need a corporate speaker, you mean you're, you're in. I heard that you actually too you're too busy protecting your golfing body nowadays. Well that is that is the priority now. I'm <laughs> trying to trying to catch up with you and I was with uh was chatting to Rory Lawson last week as well and he was talking about getting a game, so I'm a long way off you guys, but that look, everyone has to have a dream, don't they? <laughs> they do. What's your handicap at the moment? 14. It's not bad. It's not bad for, for a front row forward. For a front that row forward, e- that's excellent. Yeah. Rory, I'm wondering what's easier, coaching the Fijian national team at rugby or coaching the primary school children? What was what, what was harder for you? I'm not sure in, in what way, Husk. <laughs> well, in, in a way of you're you're not known for your Fijian ability to speak Fijian, or um, you know trying or, to marshal. Are you saying or offloading <laughs> or, or offloading <laughs> or skill set or basically anything involving anything that Fijians might want to learn? <laughs> uh, but the primary school kids will be laughing out because you're hero so best. I just wonder what was more challenging because obviously that you know you had some good games and some bad games. The the mall uplift though was outstanding oh, yeah. for Fiji. Yeah, the te- the. the it's surprising how the 10 and 11 year olds love a pick and go drill or a 16 minute <laughs> post school. And then just leave them off. And they the enjoyed it more than the Fijians, but the Fijians <laughs> were, they were brilliant. Um, we did a dinner in November, I think it was, and the following day you were going off to, jo- was it Georgia? You were playing Georgia in Portugal or something like that? I can't remember exactly what the fixture was, but how did you come to be the, the scrum coach at Fiji? What did you learn? What did you impart? And has it got legs to it? Um, so we were playing Georgia in Spain. That in was Spain. the third game. Yeah. It came about because the, the Kiwi coaches, so Vern Cotter, a guy, Jason Ryan, sort of take the forwards. They were based in New Zealand. They, If they left New Zealand, they couldn't get back in. I think Vern had went into the, the lottery to get back in. I think there was like a 1,000 spaces with 10,000 applicants. So the very start was saying, look, it's really difficult. It was Joe Schmidt phoned me as part of his sort of role in world rugby and it started off with going look they need somebody to take the scrum Vern Cotter will do the line outs um, they're getting Duncan Hodge to do the backs Richie Gray will be there um, you know would you be interested and I sort of went look of all the teams to see if one or to coach Fiji would be great you know their, the talent they have is incredible so a couple of weeks later I'd said yes but I hadn't heard much back so I sort of phoned Joe and said look what's going on he says yeah yeah we're just having a bit of trouble he said, nothing to worry about. Just I don't think that Vern can get out. So, look, you'll probably just have to take the forwards on your own. But I've told him that's no problem. <laughs> I mean, go on. Joe, I haven't ever coached before. And now you're asking me to take it. Some of these guys are some of the most expensive players in the world. The likes of the Bill Maddles of this world. And I'm uh, I'm running around coaching them, having never done it before. Um, so that's how, how that all came about. But it was an incredible experience. Um, I think probably the... The biggest thing was just such a change in in culture and, and learning for me with obviously being in the Irish system and even when you're away with the Lions, it's you know, you, you get given the information and you're expected to take it up. And 
you know, a lot of people thought when I when I went there, oh, you know, you're going to have to change because, you know, the Fijians, you can't tell them too much. You can't give them too much information at any time and all of this. But to be honest, I found they were had a real appetite to learn. They just wanted more and more information. They were more than capable of taking it all in. Yes, you have to do it a little bit differently. It has to revolve around fun and games, competition. They absolutely love competition. They want as much contact as they can get. And there are some bone shuddering hits when they're doing contact drills. But I actually think sometimes as coaches that you limit, you are limiting them by a perception that they can't take it in. Um, like every night, for example, we would have a um, the kind of religious service and they would stand up with no notes, no anything. And, you know, they would do it in Fijian and then they would translate it into English for us. But the sort of the, the theological meaning that they would bring into some of the stories is the depth. Like David and Goliath, I kind of thought it was just a, a big dude and a wee dude and a couple of stones. But the, the sort of the real meaning that they go into it is, is incredible. So the fact that they can recall all this information from, from a lot of it from being in the villages and sitting around and chatting sort of tells you that they can take a lot of information in if you get them in the right frame of mind. And Gareth Baber, who ended up becoming head coach, who was with the Sevens before that because Vern Cotter couldn't get out, was really, really good. At the end of that service, he would just use it when they're so focused as a time just to reinforce some of the learnings of the day. And, and he was really good at sort of explaining to us what we should, what we shouldn't do. Like to turn up to that service in the evening, well, they wouldn't expect this. It would mean a lot. Um, so, look, I, I loved that bit of it, but I was relieved to get home after three, four weeks and not have to go back into another rugby environment from half six, seven in the morning to nine o'clock at night. It just wouldn't just be for me that bit. <laughs> I'm interested how um, how he navigated from David and Goliath to telling some re relevant stuff for the game. Right, so basically Goliath wouldn't have gone down if he'd got his body position lower <laughs> and he'd had his head in the right place. And actually, if he'd had some support from the others, it would have been okay. Very much like when we make a line break. <laughs> Is that how he sold it? Very similar. <laughs> or else we could have used the fact that we wanted to play Wales and Cardiff and they were like Goliath and we were David. But the... You know, you, you interpret it whatever way you Fine. want to ask, because whatever I have to say, you're not going to listen to it anyway. <laughs> this is very true. I, did, I, know, I don't want to... I'm not telling tales here, and, you, and we, we can cut this bit out if you don't want to, but there was... There was one part, we don't have to name names, where they, you, you told me a story where um, they mis, they misjudged you um, as kind of an authoritarian coach, where one night you were sitting in a team room, I thought, after the last game, and you were sort of joining a beer, and they all obviously were pretending that they weren't. Would well, you want to tell a story, pretending they weren't drinking? And uh, <laughs> you, you can tell it. Yeah, so the, the sort of, like, they are very, the sort of hierarchy is really, really important to them, and... Like even during sessions, during the three weeks, it was if a senior player said something like they wouldn't ever say anything against them to the extent where if you're explaining a move and the senior player got it wrong, the, the younger player would come and ask you to change it. But we get to the last night and of course the trolley of the air has come out, you know, they'd, we'd all deserved it. We'd all worked incredibly hard for three weeks. And... Um, so then, of course, a few boys were like, oh, is there any lemonade? Is there any Coke? And I'm like, oh, all right, okay. Um, not sure who you're trying to kid, but okay. Um, so they drank a bit of that. And then some of the coaches went off to bed. And boys went, oh, we're off to bed at about midnight and um, about three in the morning. Um, so a couple of us stayed up drinking. And about maybe three in the morning, maybe a wee bit later, there was a bit of a crash coming in the side door. And there was a few of the players coming back in who'd obviously, when they'd left to go to bed, they took a wrong turn, <laughs> went to nightclub and changed up their lemonade for something a lot stronger. And um, I was still sitting there and they came in and the panic on their face. And I just went, lads, look, relax. <laughs> I, don't, I don't give a shit. <laughs> go and have a beer. Go to bed. Do whatever you want. Now, most of them were leaving at 6 a.m. to get flights. But it was sort of like just whatever you want. So the couple had pulled up a beer and we sat. Me, Hodgie, and Sam Metavesi wasn't, he was one of the ones that had sat with us most of the night. But a couple of the other players came in and it furnished them. They then eventually sat up, had a couple of beers, then had to go and try to pack, get onto the bus and fly home. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's very, very different to what you would expect. And, well, for example, like that Lions at the end of the New Zealand tour was not like that at all.
No. Pos- say, pos- wonder, hospital would... bed and a steep hill, didn't it? Yeah. Has? <laughs> <laughs> but I just, Rory, was Rory's telling me, he said that when they sat there and he's sitting there quietly in the corner, just, you know, with his bottomless legs, just drinking. And everyone's obviously even thought, oh, he's really authoritarian. Like, he's not going to be, he's going to tell us off. And then some of them are going, oh, oh, so tired. Is that the time? Like, doing all these fake yawning and <laughs> pretending to go off to bed and then crashing out the door. And Rory's just there going, sorry, do you... Like, Do you think I've not been here yeah, before? You, I got I got over a hundred caps for being an amazing player, but also an absolute legend on the piss. Like you're talking to the wrong man. Like don't worry about. It. I'll, I'll, you can use my body. I'll give you a leg up to get over the wall. <laughs> Love to have Do that you, authority. If, did you use any? Uh, did you use any Ben Ryan tactics in terms of uh, chocolate bars? And just uh, if you need to do one more contact session, just promise them a, a chocolate bar. Promise the Islanders a chocolate bar. Because he always said with the Fiji, and uh, he could he could get them to eat. Well, the, the the right foods for their body as long as he promised them a treat every now and again, didn't it? Yeah, it's so funny that um, can you say that, but like at the end of so the Friday night before the three games was the shirt presentation and I couldn't, like the first one was Spain and Madrid was sort of the real glamour tie and they're presenting jerseys and they give this bar of chocolate and I'm going what is going on here but they were so they were nearly as excited to get the bar of chocolate <laughs> as they were to get the shirt but, but the wheel came because of the climate summit happening up in Glasgow the sort of the Fijian Prime Minister had come down so he was there to do the presentation and, and with all the sort of emotion going on they'd forgotten the um, Gareth they had forgotten to give the chocolate so we said right boys everyone go and get some food and nobody moved but nobody then wanted to say anything to the head coach <laughs> And eventually somebody went, uh, what, what, about, what about the chocolate? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. They pulled a big box of chocolate out. They went bananas again. <laughs> I was just there going, like, we would have played, and the night after the game, there would have been any amount of sweets, whatever you wanted, but... It is It is just a, such a different way of life. It all feeds in to, um, to, to the fact that I think Fiji are everybody's favourite second international team and everybody will want to see them really fire up France next year at the Rugby World Cup. Can I ask you two quick questions? Because I, I do want to talk to you about England Ireland this weekend. We could talk about Fiji for, for a lot longer. But do you see, having worked with the players, you, you know, they've had a rough time at World Cups of late and I think... Uh, what was it three years ago they lost to Uruguay which was a, a sort of a, a, a massive step down for a team with so much potential do you see under Vern Cotter and with the players they've got a, a real challenge particularly now they've got a team uh, the Fijian Drua in, in Super Rugby etc are, are they are they gonna are they moving in the right direction from what you've seen I was massively impressed by them and I think the biggest problem that they have is their preparation I mean like this is sort of tier one players that are being treated like sort of tier two, tier three in terms of their preparation. Like we got, for example, in the in the week leading up to the Wales game, we went to train up at one of the pitches and like you wouldn't have put, like I wouldn't have put Bambridge fourth 15 on it. It was a bog when you ran on it. You know, the basic boys were going up to their ankles. You couldn't move on it anywhere. And like these are sort of 130 kilos. So like they're, they're fairly heavy. And um but they just got up, <clears throat> and in fairness, the only ones that it really that got annoyed by it were the coaches. We were the one, this is a disgrace, you know, we were trying to move them around, and when we went to do scrums, I kind of spied that Cardiff City Academy, the, the soccer team, where their pitch was lovely fenced off, and I went, right, lads, that's where we're going to scrummage, because you couldn't have scrummed on the other pitch, so across onto this manicured bit of turf, and I've got the manager and me going, oh, you can't use that pitch. And I go, well, by the time they come out and get us and come across two pitches, we'll have finished. We're only doing a few scrums. And we moved every time, and there was a squad of them behind sort of fixing the divots that scrum, scrums make. And I was chatting to some of the players afterwards, and they said, like, what would have happened if that was Ireland? And I said, well, first of all, we wouldn't have been there, but someone would have had a look at it beforehand and went, not a chance. And I said, if we had have arrived up there in the off chance the pitch was that bad, we'd have done the entire session on the Carter City pitch and when people tried to move us we'd have told them to fuck off we're staying here till we're done <laughs> and they couldn't believe that a team would have that sort of attitude about their training ground that you don't just take what you're given um, and that's the sort of partly what's limiting them and going to the World Cup with the preparation that, that all the teams get building into it I think that that what they can achieve is you know like it, it will have a limit somewhere but I wouldn't want to be in their group and um, I think when you look at how Wales and Australia are at the minute, they have got to be 
looking very much over their shoulder at, at Fiji and look, discipline let them down in Cardiff and that is what Vern will probably be looking to really hammer home on. That was one of the big things that they wanted us was to try to get the discipline. Um, we didn't quite achieve that, be it the red card in Cardiff for the late night at the end of the whole thing, but we tried our best that we only had three weeks, but but they are going to be a handful. They are a handful and they're going to be an even bigger handful. Would you take a Fijian coach's tracksuit to the Rugby World Cup next year and a clipboard if it was on offer? Or have you done your bet? I, I think that would be, the, the at the minute, with what I've got going on, that would be the only sort of coaching that I would be interested in. A bit like Paulie's doing with Ireland. You know, I think the international stuff, to know that you've got, there's a, chink of light at the end of because I don't mind working those hours when you have three or four weeks and then you can come back up for breath um ironically I sort of went into the Ulster Stadium shortly after Fiji and that kind of you know you get this realization of going imagine coming in here every day and doing this I just could you would follow I feel you'd fall out of love with rugby for a start but to do it in short bursts of three four weeks then sort of uh, whatever three-week tour and then know that you'd have a chance of going to World Cup. I would love to do that sort of thing. Um, now, they're obviously well covered, but I think someone like a Fiji would be incredible to do because I think there's a lot of scope for them to improve and to be better. But they also, on their day, they can compete with anyone in the world. And they have some of the best players in the world. If you're picking a World 15, you know, you're going to have a Fijian or two on it easily. Um, so that would be a real, you know, some of the... the to go in and prepare with some of the other tier two nations, um, I just don't know whether you would ever get as excited as you would trying to coach Fiji. Amazing. Isn't rugby an amazing game when you've got yeah. some of the greatest athletes on the planet and yet you need Sir Best to make it all come together? Yeah. Buller Best. He says, um, but obviously they didn't have a set piece till Bestie came along and added <laughs> that sprinkle of salt best all over it. <laughs> see what we've done there. Um, amazing. I would love to see that come together. And I think you would be a, a, you would be a big factor in, in everyone sort of really getting in behind Fiji as well. So fingers crossed that might come good. Um, let's talk about this weekend. Um, I want to come on to Paul O'Connell actually because we've spoken a lot about Andy Farrell and, uh, and Mike Cap. but I want to ask you about, about Paul's impact. But Eddie Jones saying in his presser on Monday in big bold letters, Ireland are favourites for this game. You, you comfortable with that? I think if you, if you go on form and um, for everyone outside of rugby environments or that have been in an England or an Ireland squad, will, you know, they, they maybe will believe that. I would say there'll be a lot of people in Ireland will think that. I think anyone that has played and played at Twickenham will understand how difficult it is and the look at the quality that England have. And look, I think it's a really even game. I think if Ireland can play this game that they've adapted over the last couple of years and if they can produce a performance like they did against New Zealand um, and aspects of, of France, but certainly in that November series, then they are an absolute handful. The big question is, will they be able to do it? Because France stifled them a little bit and England will want to do the same. Um, so I'm not sure their favourites. I, I just would... There are certainly a couple of question marks. Ireland have went in this incredible run of, of wins, but uh, what was it? Was it something like eight of the games were at home? And we all know, even for years, you know how good Ireland are at home. So it's can they actually front up now and beat a top team away from home? That's the next big question mark for them. I, I was just going to ask, obviously... <coughs> I've I've shifted in my views of Irish rugby over the past two years from where it was in 2019. Um, how much, how big a uh, sort of congratulations or uh, plaudits do Andy Farrell, Catty, used to be uh, Paulie O'Connell need to get from changing what was looked like quite a uh, a regimented regimented way of playing under under Schmidt to. Um, to get to where they are now and the difference in tempo, the speed of the ball, is that all credit? or is, Because it, it didn't go there immediately. It's taken a process to get it there. And do you think that was the only way? Is it Was it hard to lose those those sort of things that were ingrained in there, even for the likes of Johnny Sexton? I think it's incredibly hard to lose. And like I've heard you describing it in, in other words, um, <laughs> a bit less... Uh... <laughs> A bit less complimentary than that, Tim. So I'm, I'm glad you have shifted away. Fire but back, Roy. Fire back. That Look, that, ultimately, that worked for us. Um, and and it, it sort of took us as sort of 
a team that could produce you know, a big performance to a team that was so much more consistent. And, you know, I think that was a step in the evolution of Irish rugby to get this confidence and this sort of air about us that, that we had then. And I think in fairness to Andy Farrell, the way he stuck bad, because he got a lot of criticism early on in, in his tenure coming off the back of what had been a fairly successful era. And he has stuck to what he believes is the way rugby should be played. And it's, it's a bit like the way New Zealand traditionally have been. And it's about this fast-flowing game where everyone can play and everyone makes decisions. And, and that takes time to evolve. Because not only are you trying to get rid of the discipline and everyone knowing where they are for every phase of the game, you're also asking them to, not only are they going away from that, but they have to make decisions within this system as well. And um, it's taken time. And I think a lot of credit go to the coaches. I actually think that that Johnny in the middle of it, the real kick on this season has been, I think that he's taken a lot to do with the attack and he's helped Caddy in there and he's helped Andy Farrell to really bring what Leinster have been doing with what Caddy and, and Faz see as the perfect way to... Um, play and they've married that together and I think probably bringing in O'Connell to the because one of the big things that they have been able to keep through from Joe Schmidt's era is the breakdown and they'd lost a little bit of that focus on it and then when Paulie came in I think they focused so they've been able to get quick ball and when you get quick ball as you know as well as anyone pins you can basically do whatever you want especially with some of the runners that I have so it's been a really good Sort of, they nearly went miles away from where Joe was, and they've come back a step with the breakdown to get to where they want to be. Rory, I think um, in listening to a lot of the Irish guys who worked under Joe Schmidt, they always said that you know he was a good guy, obviously very good with with the media, but very controlling in what he, what he did. I mean, obviously you haven't been involved with Andy Farrell, but you will have talked to people. What do they say the atmosphere is like? Um, under under Faz in, in in comparison to Joe Schmidt, is it looser? Are people having fun? Are they able to express themselves? What's the vibe? Yeah, I think probably firstly under Joe, it sort of there's this kind of perception that it was everyone lock the door and listen to me and do what I say. You know, we we had a little bit of autonomy within that, but ultimately what he put in terms of structure really worked for us, and and we had a lot of crack along the way. Um, I think what Faz is doing is just that decision making. I think what he's trying to do is take away from this because there was an emphasis. If you're going to play with mass structure, people need to know what they're doing, and to know what you're doing, you need to be in front of the computers. You need to put in hours of work, and Joe put in more than anyone, and that was sort of the example set. I think what Faz is sort of has nearly brought it to is and um, do whatever you need to be to be prepared for the weekend. But don't kind of have an attitude where you just sit in front of the computer because you feel you have to be there. Um, because a lot of it is reading what's in front of you. And, and you can't really learn that from a computer. You can only learn that from the way you train. Um, so, look, like, Dave, it's hard to know how much fun they've been having as well. Because, like, they actually had a horrific time of it, you know, with COVID. No one was allowed to be in t- change in, or in, no one was allowed to be in team environments. They had to be in their own room. They had to stay there most of the time. So, I'm sure that wasn't particularly pleasant, but look, I, I think that they've, they've been given a freedom and they've trained in that freedom and they're just doing things a little bit differently. From what I gather, they've nearly tried to make it a little bit like um, the way it is in, in your own province where you sort of you still stay in the same hotel, but because the training centre, the indoor barn is a bit away, it's almost like, you know, turn up whatever you want, as long as you're there for nine o'clock. If you want to get there for half seven and have breakfast and lie around, or if you want to have a lie-in in the hotel and go later, because they're driving their cars there and stuff. So even that little bit of freedom, and a lot of it is just sometimes about changing. You know, when you get a, a long period of time that like some of these boys have been together, like the likes of Pete and Johnny have been in, been in Ireland squads for years, sometimes just the change of stimulus in terms of what you do can be... Um, massive for them in terms of their engagement and their energy. How would you have survived in kind of an environment of you know what would you have done? Would you have would you be getting there early? Would you have been relaxed? I, I, because we never really asked you that. I mean, I imagine if COVID had happened, you hadn't been able to mix with people. You would have gone completely mad, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, I think whenever you weren't allowed to go out after the game, it would have been a real struggle. But um, I think I probably would have. Um, I would have got there early. I, I like to be. When it comes to rugby, I'm generally late for most other things, but when it came to rugby, I like to be on time. 
Um, I would have probably tried to get a bit of work done, like even get there early and do a bit of throwing or do a bit of something. Um, because that's the way I would have been when I was in Ulster. Get in before everyone and and get some stuff done before people come in. Um, sneaky, but yeah, I think sneaky. That would have been, a li- yeah. <laughs> From the gusket man, but yeah, manual, secret that. trainers. Yeah. Were you a secret trainer? Uh, no, I like to train on my own, um, mainly because I didn't lift very heavy weights and uh, <laughs> it was quite embarrassing at times. I little, I lifted, but uh, I, I just like to do my own thing and train um, on my own um, in the gym. And then, I, no, I would have done a lot of stuff post when the session finished. I'd have been out and tried to do extras, and actually, I could never get my head around why. People just as soon as the session was over, cleared off. There was one guy who used to, at Ulster, like you would be just about setting up your drill to do post-session and you'd see his car driving out. <laughs> You're kind of going like, where are you going? Like, you, where's you the rush? Name the not name. serving lunch for another 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> who, was that? Who, who had the screechy tyres? <laughs> <laughs> Can't say. <laughs> uh, to be fair, uh, Rory... Actually, I could say. You, well, you say it if you there's, want. There's loads of them. There's loads of. I tell you, we, we um when I went to stay with the Sebest at, at the palatial mansion that makes Buckingham Palace look small, um he is a proper secret trainer. What we meant by secret trainer is is that you would be, if let's put using an exam analogy, I'd say to Rory, oh mate, have you revised? He'd be like, nah, I haven't done a lot. Come out of it, and he'd be like, how'd you do that? And he goes, oh brilliant. Like I went around to his house, we had a few drinks. I sat up in the morning. I said we sat to about twelve o'clock night, having a couple of beers, catching up, hearing all about the farm and the family. And I went to bed and I woke up later and I came down and he was like, you're a bit late, aren't you? And I was like, well, I thought you said, like, leave at 9.45. He goes, no, I said, get up at 9.45. I've already trained. I was like, well, where's my, where was my invite? He goes, oh, no, I've been in the gym. So he's a proper secret squirrel, yeah. getting the rig sorted, him and his missus doing CrossFit. And so I was like, and then, and then but then he gets in your head. Because when I was at Twickenham, I went, oh, you're looking in great shape. He went, yeah, we've been doing CrossFit. I was like, have you? Because yeah, I'm lifting all the time. The more beers he had, the more CrossFit. And then I rang him up the next day. I was like, look, talk to me. What, what's his CrossFit? He goes, I've never done CrossFit ever. <laughs> it's just, he's in my head, renting rooms, like not inviting me to the sessions, then telling me he's overtraining. <laughs> he's a proper king of mind games. But I guarantee everyone always says about him how hard he worked at, at um, uh, you know, uh, when he always did his extras, always did his extra training. But he definitely wouldn't tell you about it. He wouldn't let you catch you do it. But you know he'd be up at like five in the morning, heart rate monitor on sculpting the, well, not sculpting the rig, but keeping the rig in, train to maintain, basically. Grafting. Fair, is that a fair cop? I would train a bit now. It's amazing what you'll sort of do during the week to allow yourself to have a couple of drinks at the weekend. <laughs> but, um, no, we also told Hask we were leaving at nine, so he might want to be up at quarter to nine <laughs> at the very latest. And he scrolls down like, Okay. Oh, what do you mean? You said nine forty. I said no, B four nine. I know uh, my accent is shit, but it's not that bad. <laughs> it was, I mean, worked, there's no way. She also he went to bed. He was doing the old. He did the old Fiji and yawn as well at midnight. He goes, no, 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 better not have any more beer. <laughs> okay. Well, because we saw what happened the next day, didn't we? I mean, I spent a whole. I mean, even Rory's dad, who's as an absolute legend, is terrified of his son. Even he won't come anywhere near him for a drink. He's like, oh, no, I need... And he just stays away long enough, just pops in for a couple of beers because he's terrified of getting caught in the tractor beam. <laughs> like, I turned up and I was like, I've got a full day shooting. Can't embarrass myself. Want to shoot quite well. And um, I was like, he, I kept getting beers. He's like, in a minute, all his family went. The lights were dim. Even the dogs were asleep on the floor. And it was just me and Rory. I was like, this could go anywhere. So I was like, oh, <gasps> got to have a sleep. And then got up all day. And then we, yeah, you knew it was bad when they handed out the slow gin at 8.30 in the morning. Just, and I still, and half the people sounds, on the stage. Sounds like heaven. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Sounds incredible. It was amazing. I was treated to the best possible hospitality. I would expect nothing less at the Castle of Sebast. Um, back to Ireland very quickly. Who in this Ireland team at the moment most excites you? Uh, <clears throat> I think Keelan Doris is, yeah. I think in that Italy game, which is a bit of a farce, he still was incredible. Um, and you just see what he's been doing for Leinster. And I think that the thing that, Sometimes you don't get, because the Leinster are so good and they're all surrounded by the class players, but when they step up a level, they don't really show it um, in terms of, well, sorry, they do a bit, but you know, you just sometimes wonder, um, is it all a bit of a hype? Because it's a Leinster sort of thing. There is a lot of hype around. Somebody scores a couple of tries for Leinster and all of a sudden they're, they should be European Player of the Year. Uh, whereas Keelan Doris, I think, has come in and has been exceptional. He's exactly what you want from a modern-day back rower. He's big, he's powerful, 
He can handle. He does soft passes, offloads, everything, everything that bar the big bit that Hask could never do. <laughs> and it's it's really, really, it's really exciting to watch. It is interesting because I was just looking at the team that played against Italy and obviously I don't know whether it's worth talking about that game or not but if you I mean England at the moment the, the, the talk around England is that they are a team that is regenerating and there's this brand new side coming through but if you look at the side that took on Italy for Ireland Dan Sheehan Ryan Baird Caelan Doris Joey Carberry's obviously been there for a few years but he's never owned that 10 shirt Mac Hansen's just come in and our new cult favourite Matt Lowry. Matt Lowry. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of turnover going on within Ireland at the moment, and yet the results seem to be kind of kicking on. It, it, are people talking about this as a new Ireland side, or is that is that just a sort of you know something that we're doing over here? Um, I think they are. I think when you look at what what Faz did at the very start, they actually because they weren't they were struggling a little bit at the start. Some of the most interesting was the team announcement day because he actually didn't know what he was going to pick he ch- chopped and changed so much and um, whereas in the last sort of certainly this season you have got a feel for what his team was he got a little bit of criticism for picking the same team through the autumn but then they performed so well it was like okay we can't really criticize that and then he went into the first two games with the same team near enough bar bar injury and then he was able to drop in. So when when you perform and when you get confidence, you can then start to drop in a lot of these players. And because they'd all play, or a lot of them had played previously, whenever he'd capped a lot of players, um, it doesn't seem as big an ordeal for them. And I think he he's now got this balance of you know what his strongest team is, but he can also drop in a couple of players throughout as long as the spine of his team stays constant and, and I think that's the surprising thing about England I think I look at that 2019 World Cup and even if you look at the World Cup warm-ups England basically picked the same team the whole way and the disconsistency around it whereas at the minute it feels like it did two years out from the 19 World Cup whenever you don't really know like he could honestly pick anything this weekend and it wouldn't really surprise you whereas I think if Ireland go away from there will be 13 names that you could easily picked in that Ireland team that are going to play and there might be a one or two that won't surprise you just not sure which way he'll go and I think that's where they've built to um, but it also allows them to drop in someone like a Mike Lowry into there and to perform well because he's surrounded by people that are used to playing in Faz's system and are used to being around that environment. Where, where in the Ireland side do you still think there needs to be some some improvements that you know you said those 13 names you're pretty comfortable with is there any area that you feel that they still need to kind of reach up or are you pretty happy with them across the board i think their their biggest area is their depth i think that at 10 and 3 i think they've a lot of depth in in a lot of places now um compared to maybe even a couple of years ago but if something happens johnny and if something happens tag furlong i do think that ireland and look joey did well in france he just needs more time because I think that he was probably technically a little naive against Italy just because, you know, you think they're 13 men, the space has got to be out wide. But actually, you know, on a drift defence, that can it nearly leaves it easier for them versus just getting gain line first and putting them in the back foot. But Joey will get there and he's been injured so much, it's going to be difficult for him. He just needs loads of time for Munster and as much time as he can get for Ireland. But at the minute... um. I still think that if Johnny didn't play in Twickenham, I think that you would be a, a touch worried. And if Tyke Furlong didn't play, I, still, I think you'd be really worried. I think that he is one of the best players in the world at the minute with what he's doing. And he's so important to Ireland that if he wasn't there, um, I would be very concerned. That is the only pr- problem with how the Ireland setup is, is how do you get the, that valuable game time of the right level for your fly half behind Johnny Sexton that is the biggest problem it's not because there's no real ease even though what we've talked about he's stepping into massive game France away was going to be a very tough game whatever and then you're sort of stepping in you know ideally and but you can't just keep giving him Ireland can you you've got the, it's, I think that's the trickiest bit when you have Italy Italy sorry yeah. um, when you when you have such a player that sort of as you've talked about helps in the training side of it in terms of working on the attack and everything else. And it's such a focal point and pivotal role in terms of how the team plays. It's very hard for that number two 
and, and there are other players who sit into that number two and or, or they've been and gone in whether it be Burns or whoever. You know, how do you get them the necessary game time to to then take over? I, that's good. I just that's the hard thing for Ireland at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree with that, Rory? Yeah. I think the hardest thing for Joey as well is that he's been injured, but also Munster plays so differently to Ireland. You know, I think that if you look at Leinster and you look at Ulster and even Connacht, you know, they all play reasonably similar to Ireland in that, you know, they want to play, they want to play fastball, revolves around rock, revolves around people being able to play um, with the ball in their hand, whereas Munster are still a little bit, I say one-dimensional, but no doubt they'll be absolutely lambasted in Munster, but but they are compared to the other three provinces. And um, that is also the problem. So you're asking Joey to go from having not played much in Munster, but when he goes back to Munster to go to a different style, whereas all the other right halves are kind of playing in a similar system and improving in that. And the problem then is Leinster, you know, Johnny's not playing every week for Leinster, so he needs to get his game time a little bit with Ireland. And um, and it's it's so difficult. And you know, you would if Ireland don't beat England, for example, you know, you would you would love to see Joey being given the Scotland game at home. You know, and the more games that he can get, the better. The problem is they still will look at it and think France still have two games to play. If Ireland can win both games, especially the points difference they got against Italy, they actually have a chance of winning the championship. And well, you have a chance of winning the championship, you sort of have to pick Johnny. Yeah. Do, do you, sorry, do you, so do you genuinely believe that at the moment with the, the form of, of Johnny versus Carbett, you would go with him, uh, taking the fact that he's obviously a credible leader and a standard setter, if you were to take that out of the equation, would you go with him um, over, over Joey at the moment? Yeah, I actually think Johnny is playing um, some of the best rugby he's played in a long time. Um, and he's back and, and there's no doubt in my mind that, and you watch him, when he's playing, you know, he's pointing people into, into position. And I think that he's also, he's nearly pointing the some of the centres into position to get out the back of the forwards. And and I think he's coaching that system as well as playing it as he's going along. But like I say, ultimately, first and foremost for him, I think that it's been a while since I've seen him play, probably 2018, since I've seen him play as well as he's playing at the minute. And um, he, in his head, is 100% going to the World Cup. Um, I suppose in my head, I see no reason at the minute why he doesn't go to the World Cup. And, you know, if he's in his late 20s, you, you pick him every week. So if he's the guy playing, it shouldn't. And I've been in that position as well, where it doesn't, just because you're a bit older, you still want to play and you need to play. So, you know, it's not my responsibility to make somebody else better. It's their responsibility to try to be better than me, to put me off the team. So, you know, even if I'm 34, 35, 36, I want to play and. I feel that the team is a better chance of winning if I'm playing. And this whole notion that just because you're in your 30s, you shouldn't play as many games, okay, it irritates me a little bit. <laughs> Scoffing. It's interesting to hear that, that Johnny's potentially coaching. Well, I mean, he, he sort of feels like a player coach and, and has been for years already, but it's interesting if he's taking on a more kind of active role in that regard. I did mention, I, I wanted to ask you about Paul O'Connell because you've touched on Ireland's improvement at the breakdown, but just, you know, Farrell and Cat and, and Easterby rightly getting the plaudits, but can you just measure the impact of, of Paulie within that Ireland setup, particularly at line out time, actually? I was thinking, because I think their stats in that area have gone through the roof. Yeah, I think that like, Simon Easterby puts an incredible package together. And I think what Paulie has added to that is probably just a little bit around the mentality. You know, he's a he, he's a bit of a loon, like he's a psycho, really, is what he is. And um you know, you, you don't really want to cross them, especially when it comes to line outs. Like, if you get a line out wrong, you just might want to get out of his sight. Because he's are not you being saying that from, Are you saying that from personal experience? Um, something do, similar. Do, do you remember your playing days <laughs> no, with him I in that regard? A bad ball. <laughs> <clears throat> well, remember he um, he and Healy nearly hyperventilated before a Scotland game the day before it because he couldn't get the line out that he want that Paulie wanted. He couldn't do it right, and he kept messing it up. And eventually, Paulie went right. And he walked him through it and went back to the line and went right. But then Paulie called a different line out, but Kean hadn't heard it. So he ran and got it wrong, sort of bumped into somebody, fell over, and then started the hyperventilate. You know, it was taken to the side of the pitch with a brown paper bag sort of stuff. 
<laughs> everyone was there going, "Oh my god!" Now, look, it was the day before the day the day before the game where we beat Scotland and ended up winning the championship in fifteen. So Kane got it all right on the day, but that's the sort of that's the respect <laughs> he has. You know, you just want to get it right for him. And I think that technically what he's brought has been loads. But I also think that having him there, I think these young forwards want to impress him. They want to do everything they can to be the best they can because if Paul O'Connell gives them a nod of approval, that's brilliant. And I think with that, he's been given, they get a lot of confidence from knowing that he's there. And if Paulie says it, <clears throat> it's going to be right. And I think that that sort of the real mentality of when you go to the corner with a line out to go, anything other than a score is unacceptable with the confidence of having him in your corner, I think is those are the two big kind of unseen things that he does over and above the technical aspect of it. What, if anything, worries you about England? I, I still think the power game would worry me. You know, I think when, when you have Courtney Laws and Mara Toje and Ellis Genge, Jimmy George, you know, Sinclair, when you have all of these guys in your pack, um, Curry, look, they can produce big, powerful games. And I still think that France kind of, when they really turned the power on that Ireland, I don't, I wouldn't use the word struggle. It wasn't like they were, but when they got on the back foot, they just didn't quite get their game exactly how they'd been allowed to do it in November. So like those guys would really worry me. I think Marcus Smith can make things happen. Um, you're playing against a team that has somebody that can make something out of nothing. You just know your defence is going to have to be perfect the whole game. Um, so look, those would be the, the big aspects of England. Um, it's a real pity, actually, from a from an English point of view. I would have loved to have seen Marcus Smith with, with Owen Farrell outside him, just to sort of potentially guide him a little bit and, and channel a bit of this um, youthful exuberance that he has to sort of um, and channel it now from an Irish point of view. I'm obviously delighted that, that Faz Jr. isn't there. Um, but no, I, I think that there is so much to be aware, be wary of this English side. Um, they haven't shown very much with the Six Nations, but it's not to say that that Eddie won't have God knows how many mind games going on in the background all week and they'll, they'll turn up and they'll produce something special. Rory, I wonder, from, from your point of view as a, a fan, what kind of head-to-head -head really whets your appetite? Because as a player, you know, obviously the fans and media kind of believe that you're in this constant one-on-one -on -one battle with your opposition, but actually very rarely manifests itself. But for me, for my, for, for me, Marcus Smith versus Johnny Sexton is actually, you know, a pretty tangible head-to-head -head in terms of who performs well, who marshals the team, who um, whether they kick well out of hand, who has the better game. Would that that be something that will be in Johnny's head? Will he want to put the young pup, young pup in his place? Um, or are there other things on the field that, that you kind of look forward to, set a back row head on head? Um, I think that look, Johnny will want to play well. I think that there will probably be an aspect of Johnny kind of he carries things and he loves to prove a point. And I think the fact that Marcus Smith was called up to the Lions when, when he wasn't, you know, will be something that he'll really want to make a big statement at Pickenham to, to show that he should have went. Um, like, obviously the back row, but look, let's be honest, it's all about the front rows. And I just love to see that first scrum go down. And especially the two front rows are there. You know, Jamie George coming back in. There's another man that, that will want to prove a point um, you know, he's one of the best hookers in the world and he's playing against, it's like the opposite of Marcus Smith and, and Johnny, you know, it's, he's playing against a young guy that's coming in, in Dan Sheehan who at the minute thinks that absolutely everything is possible and, and how they get on um, and look, Ireland's game like France got at them a little bit at scrum time and England will want to go there and I just love that first scrum just to see exactly how it goes I was going to ask about that first scrum so obviously I've never been in the front row, thank God, never want to be. But I wondered on, on, a, on a big occasion like this, there's obviously a lot of mind games. For example, I remember when England trained against Georgia um, in a Six Nations years ago. And the first scrum that went down, everyone was fired up and Georgia basically pulled out and all the England boys fell on the floor and mugged them off. And then they went down and did something. Do, do you think there's going to be a le level of mind games? Would you go down and sort of drop the Swede a little bit on the Jamie George just to let him know you're there? You know, because you see Ellis Genge pulling up any of the fat players' shirts, so they have to keep tucking it down, tucking the darb in. Do you think that kind of thing goes on, or is that kind of gone away these days? 
I know I definitely think there are elements that goes on. You know, they they love a tactic that they want to to use, and I think that the big thing when you're sort of talking about what the Georgian did, I think the big thing when you go to Twickenham, if you kind of do the old the old pull out and get caught at it, you know, like that, that can be you can get absolutely destroyed. So I think Ireland will go there and they will want to lay a marker down in the in the first scrum. And I know we've went there a couple of times over the years and we've said, look, if we can get something in this first scrum and really go after them, it, like it does play in your mind as a front row, more so as a front row, but a little bit as a front five. And you can struggle a little bit around the place. Um, so I'm sure England will want to get a furlong because you'll want to do whatever you can to take a little bit out of his legs and get him playing a bit less. Whereas Ireland will see this is the first opportunity that we'll have in a straight up contest to actually show that we won't be physically dominated. Um, so I think it'll be really, really interesting. And as for leaving ahead or something, then ask you know me well enough. And that wouldn't be my <laughs> wouldn't be my cup of tea at all. I'm very fair and very straight. <laughs> if you believe that, you'll literally believe anything, listeners. But I'll take it because he says it so sweetly. I definitely think that the breakdown is going to be massive for this game. I think what what Ireland pride themselves and really have put down a marker at this time is stealing ball a bit really making a focus point of that but then in England well I've looked at England they've done a really efficient really well at the break really down, efficient though. at cleaning and getting fast ball they haven't really had that knife edge off the back of it yet not to say it can't come because we've seen what Marcus Smith and the likes of whoever plays March and um, Slade. Henry Slade can do um, but do you see that as a real key area is who can sort of dominate that tackle area and get the most turnovers because we know what Ireland can do off penalties and field position plus with their attacking plays that they have now but the same with England yeah, absolutely. I think, again, if you look back at the France game, from an Irish point of view, like they really went after the breakdown and they caused Ireland a lot of trouble and, and Ireland took a little bit of little bit of time really to regroup with it. Um, I think it's going to be it's going to be a real massive test in there. I think that it is something that Ireland have worked exceptionally hard on, but it'll be really... I can't wait to see if England can get quick ball because they have, they've been doing incredibly well with it as well. So it's, I think that that's one of those areas. And look, a lot of it will come down to the defence. You know, if you can get a good shot on and win that game line, the turnover is a lot easier. Whereas if Ireland end up having to soak and end up on the back foot a little bit, you, you nearly end up chasing turnovers and you commit too many to a breakdown that's lost. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be another fascinating. It'll be, I think it'll be really interesting to see what England go with in the back row. Um just to see where if they really want to go after that breakdown or not. I think it's sort of Ireland will find a place for Tag Burn, whether it's at second row or six for that reason. Interesting. I mean, that England back row will be fascinating. We're obviously recording on a Monday. I think Alex Dombrant's got COVID. Poor Tom Curry is recovering from a head knock. Sam Underhill's back into the equation. So it may well be a case of last man standing. Two quick questions before we let you go, because I'm conscious you've got to go and ensure the cows or tackle the under-10s or whatever it is you've got to go and move on to. But... <laughs> Prediction to finish with, before then, last win at Twickenham for Ireland was 2018 when you lifted the silverware, Grand Slam, my last crown, ever game. and in doing so, finished the career of a certain James Haskell, putting him into podcasting. God, that must, be, that must be one well, of the best great. days of your life, yeah. is it not? <laughs> um, memories of that day. In you the look snow. Back and it really win win. Win win. It's a day for everyone to celebrate. <laughs> you, you gave it to everybody. I think, I think you played in the snow, but just your memories of that day and, and you know, what that meant to you personally. Uh, I think the snow was probably the big memory. I remember sort of three, three and a half hours before kickoff, we'd always go out and we'd we'd throw the ball around as a as a group for a pre-match meal and going out and being, do we really have to stay outside in this? It was absolutely Baltic. And just going, because all you want is you want the, the best possible conditions to in a game that was so pressurised and so big for us to grand slam. But in the end, you kind of got to the stadium and you saw the blue lines and I was like, oh, you're almost expecting a real belt of snow, which we didn't actually get. The conditions weren't that difficult, um, despite the fact that Hask made it look incredibly difficult. But actually, was, <laughs> was reasonably good conditions to play in. And um, I think the big thing is just the way we played that day. We, we got a little bit of a let off in the first game against France with, with the outrageous drop goal by Johnny. But we just got progressively better. And to go to a Grand Slam decider on St. Patrick's Day in Twickenham and to produce your best performance um, 
was probably one of the most pleasing things we've done and, and to lift the trophy and and to go on that sort of horrifically cold lap of honour post it. Um, and look, I don't remember much of the game except the, the first, the try that CJ scored was the one where Furlong did the way offload and yeah. we tried it all week and he had made a bollocks of it all week. <laughs> and when he first called, when Johnny first called it, Furlong was going like, it was almost like a scene out of um, as the Varsity Blues where Billy Bob's like going... Big Furlong goes, is that that play where I pass it? Johnny went down, he goes, no, 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 we can't run that. And Johnny said, no, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And then we go through and score. And, you know, the, those are the, the few memories I have. My memories are more sort of in the change room afterwards and, you know, to achieve that in Twickenham. And, and that's the thing you need to emphasize, how, emphasize how difficult it is to go there and win. Um, and it was it was good crack. And in fairness to the English boys afterwards, like we had... Um, we had a, a good couple of beers and the dinner and the like a Hask and Ben Youngs and Marler, you know, look, these, these are guys that I knew, I knew well, and you know, they were like, obviously they weren't happy to have lost, but they were sort of happy. If, if anyone was going to win, it was the good guys. Isn't that right, Hask? It was, mate. Yeah, it was just good to have, a, to have a beer. And actually, do you know what? I didn't play too bad that game. I remember Eddie Jones on the bus said to me, well done. You know, I didn't know it was going to be my last game. So well done, you know, keep playing like that. You'll, you'll do well. And then I, Never, I didn't get picked on that tour to South Africa because he wanted to experiment with a couple of people, and that was that was the end of it. But it was nice to go. I remember speaking to Rory post match, giving him a hug, and saying congratulations, and having a few Guinnesses in the old spirit of rugby, causing havoc because everyone was on the steam. So it was, yeah, we couldn't have gone better really. It was just a shame that we um, that we lost at Twickenham, and that was the final game. But I, I started with a loss, I ended with a loss, but I much prefer to lose to, to Rory than the rest of them. You had some good days in between. We did have it some good days in between, bad. yeah. Final question, Sir Best, before we let you go. The winner on Saturday will be dot, dot, dot. <laughs> um, look, I think your heart will always say Ireland um, against anyone, especially at the minute with the way they're playing. But look, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if England produced a win. But my prediction is going to be Ireland um, in a very, very close game. Um, I, still, I think there'll be... I think there'll be points scored. Um, I don't think it'll be as high scoring as the Ireland France game, but if, I really hope that there is mainly because I'm I'm going to be there and I want to see entertaining rugby. But I, I do think there'll be some points scored, and and hopefully now Ireland will won't go into the shells. I don't expect them to, and hopefully England try to play some real attacking rugby, and, and we get to see some of the likes of if Henry Slade's playing or. Pretty sure to these guys getting the ball in their hand, it'll be it'll be brilliant to see. So Ireland are going to win. Are you over, are you doing telly box or corporate box? I'm actually doing a bit of a combination of both. I'm hip side for ITV. <laughs> that, which that's known as double bubble. And- <laughs> <laughs> Bring the big jacket, the padded, the padded jackets. Well done you, and fully deserved as well. Yeah. So best, it is always an absolute pr- privilege and a pleasure to have you on the show. I love the fact we've covered off Fiji in great depth. We've yeah. gone in deep into uh, England against Ireland as well. Um, what's next this week? What else? What else you got on the to do list before the game? Uh, I'm actually um, going to London on Wednesday and playing Royal St George's on Wednesday morning, and then I've a, a catch up dinner with some of the insurance guys on Wednesday evening, and then a couple of lunches on Thursday and Friday, and then end of the game <laughs> on Saturday. It's a tough life. I, I can't wait to get a message. I could meet you yeah, for a beer. Yeah. I'll let you know. We'll be. We'll, we're going to catch up now. I know you're over. He's, he's too busy. You're not paying him. He's not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Rory. Thank you very much indeed. It's always lovely to chat. Safe travels over. We'll hopefully see you at the game on on Saturday. Enjoy all that's to come between now and then. And uh, and love to the family in the meantime. Thank you for joining us. The Cheers, great mate. Sir Best. Good on you. There he goes. Brave, brave. So Rory. <laughs> brave, he so ran, Rory away, ran away. He bargained off. <laughs> ran, he ran away, away. Oh, brave so Rory. Um, what a man. I, lo- I just love... I love his outlook in life. Yeah, he's he's so, he's such a good guy. I, I, I really can't. You know, like you see people, and yeah. like, he just brings a smile to your face. Like yeah. you know, obviously, I, I love going over there and staying with him and getting to know him because I'm obviously his first reaction whenever we, whenever I met him years ago was, oh no, not not me. Yeah. So the very fact that we've kind of bonded and stuff, and he's just very intelligent, knows what he's doing. He's so charming, and everything's just just like a little bit of cheekiness. He seems so. Uh, more advanced in his post career than, than me and you already. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's the fact that he can still do the Aberdeen Angus cows whilst doing the under tens and then insurance plus golf. Over some insurance. He, he does yeah. well with the insurance. Actually, when I spoke to him, he was doing a few days a week there, saying that he quite liked it, going in there, revolutionising kind of the team building and leadership. 
But you know there are those players yeah, who... It involves a lot of beers, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. you, you know there are those players who, when they enter the corporate market, that is who they are. Yes. And then there are some who have to slightly manufacture themselves to own that corporate space. And he owns that corporate space, but you can tell there's a lot of him that just wants to go touring as well. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. He's never it's gonna, a twinkle. It's, that's why it's only a two-day-a-week job. Yeah. You'd never get more than that. Yeah. You'd stifle him. He's a, yes. he's a peacock. You need to let him fly. Uh, <laughs> Great analogy. Yeah. Great analogy. <laughs> um, do you want to quick, do a quick prediction? Um, He's gone Ireland by nose. Yeah, look, the bookies have Ireland by nose, and I think on everything that we've seen so far, Ireland will go in favourites, uh, and they are favourites actually. So I'm just hoping the way that they play, the high tempo that they're trying to play at, will then present opportunities for England to do the same. Um, now, whether that will manifest itself, I'm not entirely sure. I've got a feeling that that Eddie might try and put them back on the back foot and slow them down a bit, which might not be the greatest thing for the game. Um, I I do think Ireland are favourites, and I do think currently Ireland will, should win by a nose as well, but I'm going to flip it because I believe this England team owes a performance. I don't think they've, they've shown one yet. So where better to do it to then take that final game into a meaningful game In that Paris. could... Lots of people saying England now are very, very similar to Ireland 12, 18 months ago. It's it's coming, but it's not mm. there yet. Is this the day to make it unlock? I think it is. I think they're definitely the stiffest opposition we will have played so far by, uh, by a mile. I think even better than what we faced in the autumn. Uh, it'll be a great test to see where we're at. I think, you know, there's some more experienced heads within that Irish team. Uh, but obviously, again, on the you know the flip side of that, there are a lot of guys who haven't faced Ireland before, haven't faced this, this quality of side, so they don't have any preconceptions. Um, I think there will be uh, a real game plan from Eddie in terms of how how to deal with Ireland, the physicality, you know, that they will have ring-fenced a few talisman in their team. Ty Furlong, 100%, Johnny Sexton, uh, Kane and Doris, in terms of get, getting at those guys. Um, and actually, every time they get that ball, Two guys are calling them out, flying at them. I think you're going to see that a lot because if you allow them to get on the front foot as well as the set piece, you know, if Ty Furlong's carrying like the machine, you know, the, the twinkle toes, stepping, fending, rolling, and then doing a job on the on the scrum, it's going to be a very long afternoon. But I, I think the guys will have had that built in. They've had a nice fallow week. They went to Bristol. They've enjoyed themselves. They've worked hard. Um, and I, I look, I, I, I always would always back England. I think if you were going to go on experience in current form, Ireland are probably, you know, some some way ahead. But look, anything can happen. Twickenham, Twickenham is a great leveller. You know, Wales last week, last time where they ran out, you know, for that most part of the game, wasn't the most exciting, but they looked they looked dangerous and they allowed them to come back into it. But that was a good defensive test mm. not to let Wales win the game. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, th I wonder if Johnny Sexton's having nightmares of Courtney Laws coming at him yet, because he will be. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, what I mean. I mean, Eddie Jones has said it before, hasn't he, about targeting Johnny Sexton and everybody went mad because, um, you know, well, we're not targeting players, head, you know, head injuries and all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter what, what you say, the people are going to get ring-fenced and go, you know, here's a difficult afternoon. What happens? Yeah, well, well just from the England point of view, I, look, I know they haven't hit the ground route, but they've created opportunities. Yeah. Uh, that What hasn't been there is just clinic their clinical side of it just finishing things off and uh, they made line breaks against Wales they've made line breaks obviously against Italy and they you know they made they cr controlled the game against Scotland they just haven't yet clicked into that final gear of, of finishing off moves finishing off opportunities if that comes together it, it could be it, it could be the right day for England it's big if because yeah. at the moment they, they've struggled really with that a lot of mistakes in that Welsh game um but hopefully you get that from, you know, as you go on in the tournament, things will link up a little bit better. Um, so hopefully that will happen. Ireland for Rory, Ireland for Tins, Splinters for Hask. <laughs> Yet, again. Yet again. If you haven't already seen it, um, Bertie's gone with England this weekend, Bert the predictor. Oh, um, well, he's, from, he's generally he, three he's from doing, four. Yeah, yeah he's doing really well at the moment. Four every so week, so we're good. He knows more than his owner. Uh, we've done some filming with Hask and his pal Bertie the predictor dog. If you are familiar with Paul the Octopus from the 2010 Football World Cup, this is our GBNR attempt, uh, and he's going really well at the moment, actually. Uh, he's gone with England. The past weekend saw our second fallow week of the Six Nations, so Bertie's duties have been put on pause. <laughs> good, yeah. Love yeah, well done. Okay. That's well why you're presenting the year. Yeah. 
That's why I'm working with you two. Um, I love the fact that I said he's, three, he's generally three from four and there's only three games in a Six Nations <laughs> weekend, so I'm, I'm flying. Yeah. Um, moving on swiftly, a big thank you to City Index for making it all possible. But the predictor is brought to you by City Index, the leading provider of spread betting, CFD, and FX trading. Good luck this weekend, the Burts. Okay, so our theatre tour, we are heading off across the UK and Ireland, end of April and in May. Tickets are flying. If you haven't grabbed them yet, perhaps this will incentivize and tease you to coming and joining us. Chris Ashton in Liverpool, Hamish Watson in Edinburgh, Scott Cornell in Cardiff, Nick Easter in Newcastle, Mark Quater in Manchester, Genji in Nottingham, Jiffy Davis in Swansea, hold on to your wigs, Jeremy Guskett in Bath, and the great Sir Rory Best in Dublin. And Ben Kayser, our fourth wheel, is coming to Oxford as well. That is a good lineup. We could have that actually, wouldn't it? Yeah. Think Great got, on a night out. We've got most positions covered, haven't we? I think we probably have. We're yeah. missing a couple of. I'll fill in when needed. We? <laughs> yeah, we'll get well, filled in when needed. <laughs> um, good scouts tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we have got uh, Meg Jones on. Um, obviously, an amazing performance by the uh, Wasps women on the weekend, uh, beating. Uh, the Harlequins win for the first time. Bravo. It, yes. Big win. So, and she was player of the match, so we're going to be chatting all things Allianz Premier 15s with her and does she believe that this can uh, kick on the Wasp women's future in terms of belief in going forwards and maybe winning some titles? We shall see. Good Scouts Rugby out soon. And the last thing to mention as well, Sutton Coldfield, RFC. Yeah, I was there. I promised uh, a man there that I would mention that they are doing a Jack Jeffries. Uh, sort of mem- memorial game yeah. uh, and raise funds for his family. Obviously, uh, Jack with uh, tragedy passed away playing for Evesham, uh, and they. I did promise them that I would mention that they are having their game on the 18th of March. Uh, if you're in the area, please uh, go visit, go support um, uh, in this sad time. Absolutely. As much as we can raise and as much awareness as we can raise as well at the same time, we would be delighted to do so. Lots of solidarity and hopefully lots of good memories and fond memories we, of Jack. And we Oasis. have been blasted over the past few few days and weeks with local rugby clubs and I love it. You know, I've done a few, obviously did, um, did Sutton Coalfield's 100th centenary dinner and it's just characters galore. You've got the 14s doing all the waitering. You've got all the blazers who are all respect and it's sir and it's everything that's great. And obviously then we had Bannock Burn on the weekend and it's just, it's just, it's just nice. I mean, it gives me a nice warm, fuzzy feeling. Put inside. a little smile on the face in these quite extraordinary uh, times. Well, the uh, the army, the Scottish army with their with their Pacific Islanders has tried to knock the smile off my face yeah, and true. a few of them almost did a good, pretty good job about it. Yeah. To be fair. I'm still having no- nightmares about that seven off the back of the scrum. We, we cheered Hunting. for them, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> good on you. Um, enjoy your rugby wherever you're watching this weekend. Let's hope it's a belter in the Six Nations. We have been the good, the bad and the rugby. Thank you to Sir Rory Best and Max Mellins for joining us. We will see you next week. The show is produced by Shara Kilgallen and Pulled together by Matt Chuck Norris. The Good, the Bad and the Rugby is a Folding Pocket production. See you next week.